This week we've been at Gamescom in Cologne, Germany, checking out all the latest tech and gaming news. There's been some exciting monitor announcements which we'll run through now and we'll go through everything we learned from seeing the products in person and speaking with the product teams as well. ASUS held a live streamed conference where they announced several new products in their ROG lineup, including motherboards, peripherals and of course some new monitors. Heading the monitor news and probably the flagship product on display for the whole event was their ROG Swift PG32UCDM. This is a 32 inch class monitor, accurately measured at 31.5 inch and is using a Samsung QD OLED panel. ASUS expect this to be the world's first 32 inch OLED monitor to market with a 4K resolution and 240Hz refresh rate combined. It's got the same modern ROG styling as the 27 inch model, just now in a larger screen size with a larger resolution. We already know what to expect from the high refresh rate and amazing pixel response times of OLED panel technology, so if you do want to know more about gaming performance and motion clarity, check out our review of the 27 inch 1440p 240Hz model that's linked in the description below. The motion clarity should be excellent here and roughly equivalent to a 360Hz LCD screen. So you're getting the benefits here of a 4K resolution and with a bump of 50% when it comes to motion clarity performance in real use compared with an equivalent LCD screen of the same technical refresh rate. The refresh rate here is backed by Adaptive Sync for variable refresh rates and includes FreeSync Premium Pro certification. What is new however with the 32 inch model is the higher 4K resolution and the improved pixel density of 140 ppi. That's compared with the 111 ppi of the 27 inch 1440p model. So this leads to a sharper and crisper image. And you're also gonna get an increased desktop real estate if you're using something like 125% OS scaling. Now that provides a comfortable text size on a 32 inch screen like this. And the 4K resolution looks really good. Although you're of course going to need a powerful system to run any kind of modern games titles at 4K and 240 Hertz. This screen will of course future-proof you though as systems and graphics cards become more powerful in time. The 4K resolution is also ready to handle modern games consoles comfortably at up to 120Hz and we expect the two HDMI 2.1 inputs to support things like HDMI VRR as well. Another significant change with the new model is the shift to a Samsung QD OLED panel which brings about some changes in the image quality and user experience. Firstly, it's got a semi-glossy panel coating, which gives you a clearer and cleaner image than current WOLED monitor panels on the market. The image looks crisper and avoids the grainy appearance of WOLED panels, which is great news. We compared it side by side actually with their new 34 inch WOLED model, more on that in a moment, and the image looked crisper and popped more on the QD OLED panel. It doesn't handle bright lights as well, leading to reflections that are less diffused than a WOLED panel could offer, but personally I preferred this coating. It still has some anti-reflective properties compared with a fully glossy panel coating, so it's a good balance we felt. Secondly, the text clarity is a lot better than WOLED panels in my opinion. The panel still has a triangular RGB subpixel layout like previous QD OLED panels, so it's not perfect, but the combination of the higher 4K pixel density here and the improvements that Samsung have made in their second generation QD OLED panel technology actually does a really good job. The shape of the subpixels in the second generation is now more square with higher pixel fill, which helps with the text rendering compared with the first generation QD OLED panels like the 34 inch monitors that you'll see on the market today. Text actually looks pretty sharp and clear with very little fringing we could see. It was noticeably better than a WOLED panel which was next to it, which doesn't handle text as well. Being an OLED panel is well positioned to handle HDR content with its per pixel level dimming and true blacks. Although in the presence of bright lighting, the lack of a polarizer and the use of a quantum layer on the panel does mean that blacks can become more gray in appearance and reduce your perceived contrast ratio. This is still one of the drawbacks of QD OLED panel technology and it's a better experience if you can view the screen in a darker room if possible. There's a peak brightness spec of 1000 nits again like the 27 inch model applicable for a 3% APL window size. This reduces to 400 nits for a 10% APL and 250 nits for full field white. 
For SDR usage, we expect brightness to reach up to around 250 nits, with ASUS's uniform brightness mode being featured again, like their previous OLED displays. That will help avoid the need to use ABL dimming and it will help keep brightness consistent as you resize and move windows around and view different content. You might be wishing, of course, for a higher brightness here from the modern OLED screens, and ASUS have managed to push the peak brightness to 1300 nits on their 34-inch model, which we'll talk about in a moment. 1000 nits here is about typical for a desktop OLED monitor at the moment, with the challenges now to drive higher brightness really tied to the panel size, the heat that they produce, and general panel and display manufacturer uncertainties around the risks on lifespan if it's pushed further. Do remember that OLED desktop size monitors are only a year or so old, but we've heard from sources that the initial and current low failure and return rates are starting to give more reassurance to manufacturers that the technology can work nicely in this space without major issues. This may mean that in time we see a less risk adverse approach to things like brightness. Let's hope so, although the same kind of limits exist today even in the TV space where the smaller 42 inch and 48 inch size models haven't really improved much in a couple of generations, while larger 55 inch and above OLED TVs are getting boosted brightness due to their larger size. Related to this, ASUS are keen to promote their custom heatsink and new graphene panel backing, with, along with improved ventilation, which they expect to help improve the lifespan and reduce the risk of image retention. This will of course depend on your use case as always, and OLED is really still mostly suited to dynamic content and video and gaming, with caution advised for any prolonged static use. The OSD menu software was still in prototype stage at the event, so this needs to be finalized, but we expect to see the usual pixel cleaning, screen shift, and logo protection features included to try and reduce image retention risks. For connections, there are DisplayPort 1.4 with DSC, two HDMI 2.1 ports and USB Type-C with power delivery provided. This is along with three USB data ports, a headphone jack and an SPDIF sound output. Why not the new DisplayPort 2.1 video connections you might ask? Well, firstly there's an added development cost to using DisplayPort 2.1 at the moment as it's still early days for this technology and this connection. There's also hardly any graphics cards which feature this connection type yet. And even then, not even at the maximum ultra high bit rate UHPR bandwidth that DisplayPort 2.1 could reach in theory. AMD have 2.1 support up to UHPR 13.5, but not the maximum UHPR 20 yet. And that's only on their top end graphics cards. Nvidia don't offer it at all yet, but we would expect to see this featured on the next gen 5000 series cards though. DisplayPort 1.4 can handle the bandwidth for 4K, 240Hz, 10-bit content using DisplayStream Compression, or DSC, which is visually lossless, although it's pushing the limits of what can be delivered with this older connection type. Sure, we'd have liked to have seen DisplayPort 2.1 used, providing it really offered UHBR rates, which, according to the Visa requirement, actually isn't even mandated. But that aside, if the same can be achieved with DisplayPort 1.4 without any visual drawbacks, then it makes sense to use the current widespread connection, we think, especially if it means getting the screen to market sooner and without increasing retail price even further. We look forward, of course, to testing the screen in detail to make sure everything performs as it should using DisplayPort 1.4 when the screen is available. By the way, picture-in-picture -picture modes are supported and the screen also includes an auto KVM function allowing you to use a single mouse and keyboard to control two input sources. Now, when it comes to availability and pricing, this is a bit of a tricky area. The official ASUS press release that accompanies the event says that the estimated on-the-shelf availability will be sometime around Q1. The product manager we spoke to at the event also suggested it would be available around the middle of Q1. Our view that is that it will likely be a little bit later than this based on the panel production schedules from Samsung, but I'd expect it to appear during mid to late Q2 at the moment. It's just my gut feel, but hopefully it will end up being sooner in Q1 as currently estimated. Either way, it's not that far off, and do keep an eye on our main site and subscribe for more updates on this as we get more information. Pricing is still to be finalized, we're told, but there was some mention of a price point around 1500 US dollars at the event. We'll confirm this as soon as we can. Keep an eye on our site for more information.
Next up was a new 34-inch ultra-wide monitor, the ROG Swift PG34WCDM. It's got the same 3440 by 1440 resolution as current 34-inch models on the market, but it's now got a higher 240Hz refresh rate up from the 175Hz available already. Asus are actually switching here to a WOLED panel from LG Display for the screen, unlike the QD OLED panels that are used on the current 34-inch models on the market. This is a curved model with an 800R curvature, which is quite aggressive on a smaller ultra-wide screen like this. But it didn't look too bad in person. It's a bit more curved than I personally would like, but some will prefer the more immersive wraparound feel that it provides for gaming. We'd actually like to see some flexible options really in this ultra-wide space, and ASUS did say that they were investigating possible options for bendable OLED formats in the future. Some with a manual adjustment like the Corsair Xenion Flex that we've reviewed, or perhaps even with automatic adjustment like the 42-inch LG Flex display, although the latter of course will add some considerable additional cost to any new screen. While the panel's pixel structure has not changed from the RWBG of current WOLED panels, ASUS did tell us that they've tweaked the processing algorithm to try and improve the text clarity where possible. To be honest, we couldn't see much real improvement here from current WOLED panels, and it did show more text fringing and less clear text than things like the second generation QD OLED panels that we've seen lately. Obviously, their 32-inch model is a higher pixel density as well, which helps with text clarity, but even comparing this screen to their 49-inch QD OLED model that was also on display, which has got basically the same text size, you could see that the tax clarity was not as good here from the WOLED panel. The other change with the WOLED panel is that it has a matte panel coating. This may be a positive or a negative to you depending on what you prefer. For me, the matte coating is a bit too grainy, reminiscent of old IPS panels. We did speak to ASUS and their product team about suggesting back to LG Display that if nothing else, we'd like to see a lighter matte coating on these WOLED panels like they switched to on their modern IPS panels. The coating does help reduce reflections and diffuse more light than the QD OLED panel's semi-glossy coating, and it also avoids a lot of the dulling of the contrast that impacts QD OLED panels. So if you're using the screen in a brighter lit room, it's probably gonna be a better option. It's the same panel coating, by the way, as that used on their 27 inch model. Obviously, the main benefit here though is the increased 240Hz refresh rate, which we've already seen from current OLED panels can bring some improvements in motion clarity, as well of course supporting higher frame rates and helping to reduce end-to-end -end system latency as a result. The screen's got adapter sync for VRR, including AMD FreeSync Premium Pro certification. Of particular interest as well on this screen is the higher peak brightness, pushing up to 1,300 nits for a 3% APL window size which is actually beyond anything currently being offered in the OLED monitor market. This reduces to 650 nits for a 10% APL and is listed currently at over 250 nits for 100% full field white. Like the 32 inch model on display, the screen features the custom heatsink to avoid the need for any active cooling fans. There's also DisplayPort, HDMI 2.1 and USB Type-C connections offered here as well along with picture-in-picture, picture-by-picture, and auto KVM functions. In terms of release date, ASUS again predict a Q1 launch, despite our panel roadmap making a Q2 release date more likely. The ASUS product manager even told us he expected it to be launched before Christmas this year, so we're gonna have to wait to see what happens there. Pricing is yet to be confirmed for this model. Completing a trio of OLED monitors on display at the event was their new 49-inch Super Ultra Wide, ROG Swift PG49WCD. This was first announced earlier this year at Computex, and it's a very large format screen with a 5120 by 1440 resolution, 144 Hz refresh rate, 1800R curvature, and it's based on a second generation QD OLED panel from Samsung. We've actually recently reviewed the Samsung equivalent of the screen, the Odyssey OLED G95SC, and we were impressed by the panel's performance, including the improved text rendering from this second generation panel. The ASUS version of the screen is a lower refresh rate at 144 Hz instead of 240, which ASUS tell us was a conscious decision to try and offer an ultra wide screen like this at what they considered to be a more reasonable price point. This model again has their custom heatsink and offers a peak brightness spec of 1000 nits for HDR. There's DisplayPort 1.4, HDMI 2.1 and USB Type-C connections provided again. 
along with picture in picture, picture by picture, and auto KVM. At the press event, ASUS said that this should be launched in October this year at a retail price of $1,499 US dollars. Finally, an unexpected but pleasant surprise in the product showcase room was the forthcoming ROG Swift Pro PG248QP. This is a new 24.5 inch sized eSports gaming monitor. It's a smaller screen size, still very popular in that eSports space and built around a so-called eSports TN film panel technology. It's got 1080p resolution, it uses NVIDIA's native G-Sync hardware module and supports a whopping 540Hz overclocked refresh rate. The focus here, of course, is pretty much entirely on gaming, looking for the best refresh rate and frame rates possible, as well as using a panel technology capable of keeping up. At the end of last year, we tested the BenQ Zowie XL2566K, which has a 360Hz TN film panel, and we determined at the time that this rather aging panel technology still has its small advantages when it comes to pixel response times and pure gaming requirements. We expect the same thing here from the PG248QP, where the pixel transitions will need to be consistently driven under 1.85 milliseconds greater grade to keep up with the frame rate demands. We did have a chance to run some quick motion clarity tests and we were really impressed by the performance in practice. There's a few different overdrive modes to choose from, of course, and there was no sign of any noticeable overshoot in the optimal modes. We'll need to put the screen through our full testing process, of course, to learn more, but our initial impressions were positive. The native G-Sync module helps ensure reliable VRR performance and a wide operational range for VRR as well. It also supports, importantly, variable overdrive and super low input lag. The screen also includes NVIDIA's Reflex Latency Analyzer tool for tracking and tweaking your system latency and their new ULMB2 blur reduction mode. We had a chance to play around with the on-screen display menu on the PG248QP and found that as well as a pulse width setting for tweaking the length of the strobe in ULMB2, ASUS have also nicely added a strobe timing function here, which is great news. Via a simple slider, you can fine tune the strobing to control which areas of the screen are the clearest and clean up any remaining strobe crosstalk for the areas you were focused on in games. Motion clarity looked super smooth and clear in ULMB2 mode, delivering the equivalent motion clarity of a hypothetical 2160Hz monitor when it's enabled. There was no word on pricing or release date for this screen yet, but we've asked ASUS for an update and we do look forward to testing this monitor when it's available, hopefully pretty soon. We'd love to hear from you in the comments section if you're planning to buy any of these new monitors or if you've got any questions at all. We'll be featuring full reviews of the new displays when they're available, so do make sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date. Thank you for watching, I'll see you next time.